Thank you, Matthew. To Master Naturalist present North Texas Trees, highly prized by wildlife. Today's presenter is Rick Travis. Rick owns a bachelor's degree in forest management and an MBA, both from Stephen F. Austin State University. With retirement from his business career, Rick is fulfilling a long deferred involvement in the environmental sciences. He is an active member of the Blackland Prairie Master Naturalist chapter and is currently serving as chapter president. He's also a member of the City of Frisco's Urban Forestry Board and a volunteer trail guide at several places, including the Herd Wildlife Sanctuary, the Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, or LELA as it's commonly known, and Frisco Parks and Nature Trails. Rick is the first ecology trees instructor for several master naturalist chapters in the North Texas area. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate uh, appreciate you having me. Appreciate being here, everyone. I, I do hope you enjoy the talk. I'm excited about it. I never, never uh, always love to talk about trees. I have a great passion for trees, and I'm so happy Greg's given me three whole hours to talk about it today. Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't want to give Greg a heart attack. Uh, we can do this in one hour. I have quite a bit to share with you, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we're going to get started here. So give me one moment to start from the beginning. There we go. So what we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna to take a walk through the woods and we're gonna be looking at uh, our native trees uh, in the North Texas area that are the most highly prized by wildlife. They're very valuable. They're, we're not gonna cover all the trees uh, that we would have in the area. We don't have time for that, but I have two dozen that I've selected for this talk that um, are the, uh, the best of the best when it comes uh, to our, our eco regions and our ecosystem in the area. Now, this is my definition of native that I use to, to use when I talk about native trees. These are gonna be tree species that lived in the North Texas area prior to 1700. 1700 is when uh, we had European settlement begin in the area. And with that, we had agriculture start, we had plants introduced, trees introduced, ranges changed. So um, I'm considering native trees to be trees that were uh, flourishing in our North Texas woodlands prior to 1700, prior to that period. Now, what makes these trees that, that we selected so important? Why are these so important to wildlife? Well, these are very wide ranging and significant populations in each of these species. So there's a lot of them. The fruits and seeds of these trees are a food source for several different species. And these trees are also a host for adult butterflies and moths in the raising of their larval young. And let me explain what I mean by being a host. They're the nursery for a lot of adult butterflies and moths. The, uh, the female butterfly or moth will uh, lay their eggs on these trees. And when the uh, eggs hatch and you have your caterpillars, the caterpillars will utilize the foliage as their food source till they're ready to, ready to pupate. So that, that's, that's important. So a lot of our butterflies and moths use these particular trees uh, as their nursery. Now, that's important. We, we all love our butterflies and moths, but let's move up the food chain a little bit to understand why that is so important, why that's such an important role for these trees. Because these caterpillars are a major source of food for a lot of our birds that feed their, their, their clutch, feed their young caterpillars. And that includes even seed eating birds that normally as adults would eat seeds, but their, their kids are growing very fast, their clutch is growing fast. And so they always endeavor to give them as much protein as possible and boy, caterpillars fit the bill. Insects are always high in protein and caterpillars are soft, pliable, easy for a, uh, a baby chick to eat or nature's hot dogs is a term that's been used for them. So that's another reason why it's so important these trees are hosts for butterflies and moss. Okay, we're gonna talk about our first group or genus of trees, which are probably the most important genus in North America uh, at this time, and that is the oaks. Key identifier for oaks, well, they do have acorns. If you have an acorn, you have an oak tree. The leaves on oak trees are simple and alternately placed on the stem. If you look at the upper, upper right um, illustration I have there, uh, that kind of illustrates what I mean by that. By simple leaf, I mean you have a leaf bud, and then you have a single blade leaf. Uh, in terms of alternate placement, these leaves will walk their way up the stem. If you look at the illustration, it's left, right, left, right. They're not opposite each other directly on the stem. They kind of step their way up the stem. 
That is a typical placement for your oaks. There are two groups of, of oaks, uh, and um, this, this deals with their, their behavior and the physio physiology a little bit. Uh, there's the red oak group, and those leaves on red oaks will have bristle tips, which I'll show you shortly in some photographs. And the acorns of the red oak group take two seasons to mature. So the flowers, the oaks are going to begin flowering soon. When those flowers are fertilized and they'll begin to grow acorns, those acorns will not mature and fall off the tree until next fall. The acorns that will fall off this fall began their cycle last spring when they were fertilized. The other uh, group of oaks are the white oaks. Uh, these, uh, these oaks do not have bristle tips on the leaves and their acorns mature within a single season. So the uh, acorns that begin their cycle beginning in the spring, they will be ready to mature and fall off the tree uh, this, this coming fall. Okay, the first oak I want to talk about is the bur oak. This uh, oak grows in the Blackland ecoregion uh, primarily, uh, which has heavy clay soil. Uh, it is uh, one of the kings of the oaks. Pretty easy to identify. The leaves are large. They can be six to eight inches long. Uh, they will have five to seven lobes or sinuses on them, which is typical for most oaks. As you can see from the illustration on the right side, they'll tend to also have uh, kind of a paddle uh, at the end of it where they have a lot of surface area at the end of the leaf. Uh, and as typical with oaks also, they tend to have a bunch of leaves that come out of the the end of the of the stem. The tree is large, can get up to 80 feet tall, a big burly tree. Everything about this tree is burly, big wide trunk. You get five to six feet wide, the tree can get 80 feet tall, big thick wide limbs on it. And the acorns are huge. Matter of fact, they're the largest acorns of any oak in North America. You can see the little inset illustration there uh, at the bottom. Uh, they can be uh, around here, they'll be like one inch by one inch in size. In the southern range of the bur oak, they can be as, as wide as two inches by two inches. So that's not an acorn you want hitting your head from 80 feet up. Uh, it's, it's a big tree. They tend to grow on lower moist slopes. You'll find them in bottomlands along creeks and rivers. Um, and they, they do like a moist, moist environment. Uh, it is a great Blackland Prairie tree. Uh, also grows on either side of the Blackland Prairie area. Very disease resistant, uh, drought tolerant. It makes a good landscape oak too, if anybody's shopping for, for oaks to put in their yard. It has a great value to wildlife. Uh, as I mentioned, the large acorns are prized by deer and small mammals. Uh, deer eat the leaves, twigs, and bark, which would be a bit of a broken record with oak trees. Uh, and this tree is also the larval host for the Edwards hair streak and the Horace's dusky winged butterfly. A companion tree in the Blackland Prairie Eco region uh, for the borough is the chinkapin oak. Uh, this is also another white oak. It's a member of the white oak group. So, if you, but its leaves are very different from the bur oak. Uh, they're not, they don't have lobes and sinuses. They have these broad teeth on them. Uh, and this, this leaf can get pretty large. I've seen them as long as eight to nine inches. Typically they get to about six inches uh, long by a few inches wide. It resembles another tree that grows in the South called the Allegheny chinkapin. And that's hence, that's where it got its name of chinkapin oak because of its resemblance to the Allegheny chinkapin. Uh, the bark is not as dark or as deeply furrowed as the bur oak. It's lighter gray, a little bit shaggier look. A uh, tree gets pretty tall, uh, 60 to 80 feet tall. Uh, grows in the same area in general as the bur oak, lower slopes, bottom lands, uh, moist areas of that nature. Uh, the, uh, the acorns are not as large as the bur oak acorns, but they are the sweetest of the, uh, of the acorns of the oaks in our area. They're actually edible off the tree. They're not great, but you can eat them. Uh, you also can roast them, I understand if you roast them, never done it myself, uh, they're pretty good that way. So that is the chinkapet oak. Uh, the, uh, the deer eat the leaves and twigs, the acorns are sweet as I mentioned, and it, uh, this tree is the larval host for the gray hair streak uh, butterfly also. Now this, these are a couple of red oaks, and we're gonna talk about these two red oaks together, the Schumard Oak and the Texas Red Oak. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what the ranges are. The Schumard Oak ranges in East Texas and we are on the west end of its range. The Texas Red Oak hails from the central part of Texas in a wide band and rolls up into the Metroplex. So these two oaks uh, have an overlapping range in the, in, the, in the North Texas area, in the Metroplex area. And these two oaks interbreed. So we have a ton of hybrids in the woodlands. So I've basically given up in the woods, in the wild, 
trying to differentiate Schumard and red oaks, because frankly, most of them are mutts anyway. They have genetics from both of the species. However, in landscaping, this is a popular landscape tree, and you can differentiate them there where you have more of your cultivated purebred versions. Uh, as I mentioned, these are, these are red oaks. So if you'll notice on the lobes uh, of these trees, you see these little bristles in the photo. That's how you can tell a red oak group uh, tree from the white oak groups. You won't see these bristles on your bur oaks and your chinka pin oaks and other white oaks. You tend to have five to seven uh, to possibly nine lobes uh, and sinuses on these. The Schumard oak is the larger of the two. It can get up to 100 feet tall with a single trunk as a kind of a gray bark. It's a little bit platy and will have that light and gray coloring. Uh, that picture on the left side is real typical look of a Schumard red oak. Uh, as you look up in the tree and you look up into the trunk. The acorns are very different on the two. And once again, don't drive yourself crazy in the woods. But if you're looking at a, a tree that's in landscaping, you can try to differentiate and see which species you have. The, uh, third, from the, um, the third from the left is a Schumard acorn. And it has a, a very shallow cap that doesn't cover much of the acorn. It looks like a beret. I like to use the term from a descriptive temp standpoint. It looks like a beret on, on, on a head. The, uh, the Texas red oak is more like a woolen cap on somebody's head and it covers about a third of the acorn. So that's one way that you can tell, uh, to, can tell the difference between the two uh, more pure species of these oaks. Um, I do wanna mention that both of these oaks are red oaks and red oaks are very susceptible to oak wilt, which is a fungal disease, which has been ravaging the central Texas area around San Antonio and Austin. It is present in the Dallas Fort Worth area uh, but not near as bad. But uh, if Schumard oaks or Texas red oaks uh, get get um, oak wilt, they don't last long. They'll usually die with it within months. Uh, so don't trim your oak trees from February through June. That helps prevent the spread of the fungal uh, disease, which is carried by bark beetles. So that's just a little um, horological advice for everybody. All right, value to wildlife. Uh, acorns are eaten by birds, deer, and small mammals. Deer eat the leaves, twigs, and bark. And it is the larval host for the Horace's dusky winged butterfly. This butterfly seems to like oaks. I do believe it is a host. It uses all the oaks in our area as, as a host. Okay, our next oak, as we walk down the trail, is a blackjack oak. This tree does not grow in the Blackland Prairie. It grows to the east and to the west of the Blackland Prairie clay. You'll find them in the Mid-Cities area where you have your cross timbers forests. You'll also find it in the post oak savanna to the, uh, to the east, off into East Texas. Uh, it's not a big oak by oak standards, gets up to maybe 60, 50, 60 feet tall uh, with maybe a foot or two wide trunk. Its leaves are pretty distinctive. They're thick. Uh, they have kind of a waxy coating on top. They're they have three shallow lobes at the end of the leaf, as you can see from the, uh, the photo we have there. It is in the red oak group, so you can see the little bristles at the ends of the leaves there. Uh, the bark is very dark and very platy. This is a good illustration of what a mature black uh, jack oak um, trunk looks like. And they can get pretty scrubby. And as you move west uh, into the western cross timbers, which are around the mineral wells area, they're really, they're really very, very scrubby. And the cross timbers forests, which run north and south through the mid cities, uh, that's blackjack oaks. One of the reasons that uh, that forest got an early name by settlers as the cast iron forest because of the low branches and the scrubby nature of the tree. A little hard to push through if you don't have a trail. But that is the blackjack oak. You do have these in the Great Trinity Forest, I understand. Bayed wildlife, acorns are eaten by birds, deer, and small mammals. Deer eat the leaves, twigs, and bark. Uh, this tree is a larval host for the Horace's dusky wing and the white M hair streak butterfly. Uh, this is the blackjack oak's companion cross timbers tree, and it also grows in East Texas. As a matter of fact, uh, the post oak is the most widely distributed oak in Texas. It may be the most populous in terms of number of trees also. Uh, it's one of my faves. It grows to about 50 feet tall, and it can grow about 50 feet wide with these long lateral branches. Real pretty oak. Um, its, its leaves are very distinctive with usually five lobes on it. And this photo shows the classic pattern for a post oak. It's like a Maltese cross. Now, sometimes they won't be quite as clear and distinctive as this, but um, this is, if you see this, you've got yourself a post oak. Its bark is lighter in tones, more of a mid gray versus the dark black jack oak 
uh, trunk. So that's one way you can differentiate them also. It's a little shaggier, not quite as deep uh, with the furrows. Um, the, um, the one thing about the post oak that I do want to mention um, is, is that it is susceptible to shock uh, if it, the root system is damaged. So development really harms this tree. So if you have any post oaks, you're doing any development or doing any digging around post oaks, do it a long way away from the post oak because it just doesn't handle soil distur disturbance or root disturbance well at all. One thing I failed to mention with both of these cross timbers trees, the black jack oak and the post oak, uh, they don't just grow in, in along creeks and streams. These are cross timbers forest trees. So they will grow both down close to creeks and streams, but they will grow all the way up into upland areas too. They like sandy soil, gravelly soil, as opposed to the more clay type soil that burr, uh, burr oaks and chinkapin oaks live in. Fade to wildlife. Uh, acorns eaten by birds, deer, and small mammals. Deer eat the leaves, twigs, and bark. The tree is the larval host for the horse's dusky wing and the northern hair streak butterfly. Our last oak is one of the live oaks. It's the escarpment or Texas live oak. Um, this grows through the middle of Texas and does range up naturally into North Texas in the Cross Timbers area. Uh, I do find these in uh, Blackland Prairie, usually along creeks or streams where the soil is a little sandier. Uh, live oaks, which everybody pretty much, you know, it's a very ubiquitous landscape, landscape tree. They're called live oaks because they retain a lot of their leaves during, during the winter time, so they look like they're live. They are in the white oak group, but they have a few characteristics of red oaks. When they're very young seedlings or saplings or their new leaves, sometimes they'll have little points and little, it almost looks like bristles, as you can see from that middle photo on them. Uh, but as they mature, then they will move into these, uh, just these uh, narrow oval-like leaves that don't have any kind of points or bristles on them. Uh, they can be, the, the Texas live oak can be thicket forming. Uh, so they can grow um, grow pretty pretty thick, dense uh, uh, areas where what you have is the Texas live oak. Can get about 40 feet tall and just as wide. It can be a very wide, wide tree. Uh, amongst the live oaks, the other live oak is the southern live oak, which grows along the coast. Uh, the southern live oak, and some of them have been planted here as landscape trees, did not fare very well during uh, Snowmageddon last year. They don't handle extreme cold uh, like that. The live oaks that were escarpment live oaks, uh, which is mostly, I believe, what, they, what, is, what is cultivated and sold here, they can handle the cold weather better. So if you happen to be planting a live oak on your property, uh, make sure you're getting a Texas live oak and not a southern live oak. Um, it will fare better during uh, our occasional really cold winters. Uh, the acorns are eaten by birds, deer, and small mammals. Deer do eat, uh, work through their way through this tree. This tree is the larval host for the ubiquitous horse's dusky wing and a variety of hair streak butterflies. All right, we'll break it up. We've got a quick question, a little Jeopardy question uh, for you here. Category is tree biology. Put this in chat and see how you, see how you answer. Uh, the substance found in the cell walls of trees that makes them rigid and woody. So what, what makes a tree a tree? Think of it that way. I'll give you a couple of seconds to chat and then I'm just gonna blare away and tell you what it is anyway, but think through it. I see cellulose, we'll talk about cellulose. Ooh, Bob Siegelin got it right. So let me tell you uh, what it is. The answer is lignin. It's a special substance that makes wood wood. Let me explain how this works. All plants uh, have cellulose in their cell walls. Cellulose is really important for plants. It's kind of like it, it holds the plant together. It, it creates structure and holds water in and it handles uh, water pressure. Think of it like a water balloon and the plastic balloon is your cellulose in your plant cells. And uh, the way that works, that's why when plant, a plant, a non-woody plant is full of water, it stands straight up, it gets thirsty, we have a drought, it gets dry, it'll lean over, shrink up, and then when we get a rain, it will fill back up. It's like a balloon filling back up. However, think uh, with a tree, as trees evolved and they wanted to get bigger and bigger as they fought for the sun, um, uh, that without something, a special ingredient within those cell walls, Think about if you tried to stack 100 water balloons together vertically on top of each other, what would happen? Well, they would start to break. They would, the pressure, the external pressure of the weight would start to break the balloons. 
So interstage right, lignin. Uh, lignin became an important part of trees that allowed them to get bigger because lignin provides a lot of external uh, rigidity um, the, the, for external type pressure. Think of it this way, you take your water balloon, uh, which can handle an internal water pressure, but can't handle getting stacked like that. Put it, make a little concrete box, put that water balloon in a concrete box. That concrete box that it's sitting in is lignin. Now you can stack 100 or 200 or 300 of those up uh, together and it will hold that those plant cell walls, uh, those plant cells together. Uh, so you've got your cellulose and your lignin working hand in hand in uh, handling the pressure uh, gradients within the tree, both external and internal. So that is lignin, very important. That is what makes wood, wood. All right, moving on, we're gonna go to the elms now. Another very important genus, key identifier is that they have an asymmetrical leaf base, which I'll show you shortly. The leaves like the oaks are simple and alternately placed on the tree. And our native elms all have double toothed margins and they're pinnately veined, which means you have one central vein going to the end of the leaf uh, from the leaf stem. And then you have secondary veins branching off at roughly a 45 degree angle. Oop, I went a little too fast there. And our first elm is the American elm, which is uh, I consider the greatest elm in North America for many reasons. Uh, its leaves, as you can see, I, can, I mentioned that they are asymmetrical. See how the end of this leaf here, the beginning of the leaf at the leaf stem, uh, which is also called a petiole, is broader, a little wider uh, than the other side. That is typical for elms. Notice the double teeth. Uh, notice the single primary vein with all of these secondary veins rolling off of it at a 45 degree angle. American elms are shiny on top. They lay fairly flat, they're pale on the back. Um, the trunk is uh, fairly dark and deeply furled. This tree is a beautiful tree. It can get up to about hundred feet tall with wide arching uh, limbs at the top of the tree. Uh, it, think of it as like flowers in a bud vase. It kind of shapes itself that way and creates really high shade, which makes it a beautiful landscaping tree. These trees are about to flower really soon if some of them haven't already started. And once they uh, flower and the flowers are fertilized, they'll create these little seeds, which you can see in the inset. And the little seeds will have, will hang down and have a little notch at the end and these little cilia-like hairs on them. So this is uh, one of the ways you can tell before the leaves even show up that you have an American elm. A uh, quick story about the American elm. We almost lost this tree due to Dutch elm disease in the 20s. And it was a lesson in not planting a monoculture because of its beautiful nature as a landscape tree. And along the Eastern seaboard, all the major cities along their boulevards planted them tightly on each side of their major roads um, and to create this great cathedral-like canopy over, their, over, the, uh, over the streets. Well, that, that created fairly stressed trees and then when this fungus called Dutch elm disease came over and knocked over all the elm trees in the cities like dominoes, uh, it just went from tree to tree to tree and killed them all, killed a lot of them in the, in the wild also. But the tree has survived. There was a small percentage that is more um, resistant to Dutch elm disease and American elms in the woods are healthier and can resist uh, diseases of this nature better also. The Dutch elm disease is still with us. It's, it's a nuisance though in the area, uh, but we do have American elms and large American elms in our woodlands in the North Texas. You'll find this tree in bottomlands, mainly along creeks. It seems to like to hang around um, or, uh, stream, stream banks and things of that nature. That's usually where I find them. So value to wildlife is, is very wide. The deer eat the leaves and the twigs. Songbirds eat the seeds. Small mammals do eat the fruit and samara and is the larval host for several butterflies, including the morning cloak butterfly, the question mark, the painted lady, the Columbia, I'm sorry, the uh, the comma and the Columbia silk moth. A um, companion elm in the area that looks similar to it is the slippery elm, not as common in our area as the American elm, but widely dispersed uh, throughout the Northeast United States. I'm mainly gonna mention the differentiators between it and the American elm. Leaves are about the same size, but they're very rough to the touch. The American elm leaves are generally very smooth to the touch, but that's not an absolute identifier because sometimes young American elm leaves can be rough to the touch. However, notice in the middle picture, the leaves are kind of folded up on the slippery elm. That's pretty typical with a slippery elm, whereas the American elm leaves will lay flat. 
these kind of tend to fold up a little bit. Another differentiator when you have leaves are, are the venation. If you look at the backside of a leaf, if most of the secondary leaves uh, on the elm leaf are forked before they get, they begin to fork before they get to the margin or the edge of the leaf, you have a slippery elm. You may see two or three of these types of forks on an American elm, but with a slippery elm, the majority of the secondary veins will, uh, will fork like this before they get to the margin. Also, the, they will be flowering a couple of weeks later generally than American elm, but when they flower and they create their seeds, notice there's no hair on the edges of their seeds and there's also no notch on the end. They also lay much more tighter on the stem. They don't hang, excuse me, they don't hang down like American elm um, uh, versus uh, the slippery elm versus the American elm. The uh, slippery elm uh, pretty much has the same value as the American elm. Uh, and it is the larval host for the morning cloak butterfly and the Columbia silk moth. Now this, is a, this next elm is a very popular landscape tree. It's the cedar elm. Uh, it has the smallest leaves of any of our native elms. They rarely get an inch long. They can get a little longer, but generally you don't see them that way. Rough to the touch, they feel like a cat's tongue when you rub, when you rub the leaf. Uh, they are double toothed and they're fairly blunt ended, as you can see from the photo. It has shaggy gray bark, is not, doesn't get as large as the American or slippery elm, maybe 50, 60 feet tall, you know, maybe a two foot wide, two foot wide trunk. Um, uh, the difference between cedar elm and the other two elms we talked about is this, this uh, is a native elm that's, that flowers and seeds in the fall, which makes it important from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, the American and uh, slippery elm, as I mentioned, seed in the early spring. Uh, this this uh, species seeds in the fall, and it becomes, because of that, it becomes a very important winter browse uh, tree uh, for our wildlife, both our mammals and our, our either migratory birds or birds that just live here in the winter time uh, when food is a little bit more scarce. This tree is pretty susceptible to mistletoe. Um, so you'll, you can see it a lot right now where they've lost their leaves, but you still got these balls of green you see inside the tree uh, all in the canopy. And that is, that is American mistletoe you're looking at. Um, it usually won't kill the tree, but it will slow its growth its growth down if it gets heavy enough. So the deer do eat the leaves and twigs. Uh, songbirds and small mammals do eat the seeds. Um, and this is a larval host for the morning cloak and the question mark butterflies. That's the cedar elm. Now we're going to move uh, down the path to our third genus of trees, the ashes. These, are, these leaves, uh, the structure of an ash is very different from both the uh, elm and the oak. They have compound leaves. And by that, I mean you have a leaf bud. And instead of just a single blade, you'll get a central stem off that bud called a rachis. And from that rachis, you'll have leaflets that will grow off of it. So there's no bud associated with these leaf blades. Hence, they're called leaflets. Also, each of these, this whole thing is a leaf. And the leaves on ashes are situated oppositely uh, on the stem. So they hop their way up the stem as opposed to walking their way up the stem. Uh, the seed is a single wing samara, which we'll look at shortly. And this species is dioecious, which means you have male trees and female trees. The male uh, trees flower and they put out pollen. The, male, the female trees, they flower and they accept the pollen and they will create the fruit and have the seeds. The first ash we'll look at is the green ash, which is the most common ash in the area. This tree likes to grow in bottomlands. It likes pretty wet soil. Uh, it's, it's easy, pretty easy to identify. It has lancelet leaflets on it. Um, as you can see from the illustration, they're fairly dark green and they're pointed. Uh, if you look for a leaf, they don't have leaves on right now. So if you look at a leaf scar on a green ash, the leaf, this is where a bud would be. The leaf scar, which was last year's leaf, underneath will be flat entirely underneath the new bud uh, or the bud scar. Uh, that that will that'll be an important differentiator between the other species we see in the area. Also, if you happen to have a female uh, that you can look at seeds, they have fairly large samaras. That's what you call a winged seed fruit uh, with a very tapered seed pod. That's what we have right here. And the wing on this, on this seed pod generally will roll all the way up to the, uh, all the way up the side of the seed pod. Ashes in general will have this light gray bark that has these uh, uh, fairly narrow uh, uh, fissures and furrows that 
are diagonal. So you create, you get this diamond pattern impression on ashes. In the woods, they grow tall, up to 80 feet tall uh, and with a very high canopy. Uh, value to wildlife is the deer eat the leaves and twigs. Uh, the birds and small mammals eat the seeds uh, and is the larval host for the tiger swallowtail, the orange sulfur, the uh, cloudless sulfur and the morning cloak butterfly. Before I leave the green ash, uh, I will just mention that the, uh, there's a scourge on ashes going through the country right now through North America called the Emerald Ash Borer. I can talk about that when we get into our Q&A session uh, if you would like. So if anybody wants to bring that question up, we can talk about the Emerald Ash Borer uh, issue with ashes at that time. Uh, a companion ash in our area is the Texas ash. Just to the east of the Metroplex area grows the white ash, which is a, a great ash, high quality ash. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on Texas ash because that's really what you find in, in our area in, within the Metroplex. Uh, it grows a little more upland generally than the green ash, uh, be on the higher slopes, but their, their habitats do overlap. The Texas ash leaves are a little rounder, a little more broader football shaped not as shiny usually uh, also. And they will usually have less leaflets. The uh, green ash will have seven to nine leaflets on a leaf. The Texas ash generally will have five leaflets, sometimes seven leaflets. Um, also, its seeds are smaller and notice that the seed pod is blunter, uh, more pill shaped, and the little blade does not roll all the way up the sides of the seed pod. And if you look over here at leaf scars, this bottom inset is a Texas ash leaf scar, which is kind of V-shaped, and the leaf scar goes partially up where the new bud would be. This one, which looks more like a horseshoe, is a white ash. So remember, green ash, flat, directly underneath the leaf uh, bud uh, scar or leaf bud. Uh, the other two ashes would wrap around the leaf bud more. Uh, the deer eat the leaves and twigs. Birds and small mammals eat the seeds, and it is a larval host for the eastern tiger swallowtail. All right, another quick Jeopardy question for you. More tree biology. So within a tree, what is the vascular tissue that zips water and dissolve minerals up from the roots? And that zips is a little bit of a hint. The vascular tissue that zips water and dissolve minerals up from the roots. Don't have it yet. It's, it's what moves things up the tree. The answer is xylem. It's the xylem cells within the tree that will pull water and the minerals up to help feed the leaves primarily as the leaves are going, you know, working hard and under photosynthesis in creating, creating sugars for the tree, food for the tree. So xylem is the set of cells uh, that, uh, that pulls water and dissolve minerals up from the ground, up from the roots. All right, here's a handful of other large native uh, North Texas trees. The black walnut is first up to bat. This has compound leaves, which uh, are alternately placed on a stem. The leaflets are a little wider in the middle versus both ends of the entire leaf. So the whole leaf complex is a little bit of an oval football type shape. Very dark, heavily furrowed, solid looking bark. The wood in a black walnut is beautiful. It's a woodworker's dream. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, um, doesn't warp, it, it cuts well, and it's a very popular woodworker's wood. Uh, the fruit on a black walnut, you can see from the, uh, the picture, is a large round ball, and inside is a much smaller nut. It's a very well-protected, very well-protected nut. Uh, one a way you can tell a black walnut just from the fruit, uh, you know, if you see this very round fruit that's bigger than a, uh, than a ping pong ball, uh, you know, you've got a black walnut, but also if you look at a leaf scar, it has what they call a monkey face look to it. It's got two little eyes, a little smiley. Some people also say it looks like E.T., the extraterrestrial from the movie. So that's one, and these are pretty large leaf scars too. That's one way to identify. If you're still not sure, take a stem, pencil size or smaller, and cut that stem longitudinally along the length. And inside the middle of the stems, you'll, you have an area called the pith. Well, with the pith in a black walnut is chambered. It's not solid, and that's a very rare uh, that's a very rare feature uh, in North Texas. So, if you see a chambered pith, you know you're pretty sure you've got yourself a black walnut. The nuts are important food source mainly for squirrels because they're hard to get to, and squirrels can get to them. Uh, this tree is the preferred uh, larval host for the gorgeous luna, luna moth, 
and the regal moth also. Black walnut, great tree. The next tree is the black willow. You don't want to put this tree in your front yard or backyard or anywhere near your house or your plumbing or your foundation, but it's an extremely valuable tree in our woodlands and in our ecosystems. Uh, the, the, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The leaves are simple, alternately placed. This tree is dioecious, so you have boy trees and girl trees. Uh, uh, the, uh, the bark is very shaggy, um, as you can see from the picture. The tree generally doesn't grow straight up. It will grow at a 45 degree angle, sometimes parallel to the ground because it tends to grow along stream banks and next to water on banks. This is a pioneer species tree. This is one of the very first woody species that will show up on new land. For instance, a river changes its course um, or a, a, a pond, whatever moves or shifts, any water wave shifts and leaves open sand or, or, or dirt. Uh, black, you'll have grass and you'll have your initial plants, but then black willow begin to establish itself there. And that's important from an erosion control standpoint because black willows being what they are have very aggressive, fast growing and fibrous root systems. So they hold those banks down and stabilize the soil. And that makes it very important from an erosion control standpoint. But that's also why you don't want them near your house too, because it, they have very aggressive root systems that will get into your, your sewer lines and uh, you know, get into your foundations. Um, the, the tree is very popular with wildlife. Uh, it's uh, bark, tender twigs and buds are food for browsers, uh, such as deer, rabbits and beaver. This is the, the favorite food of beaver uh, is, is, is uh, the black willow. The tree is also the larval host for a lot of, um, of Lepidoptera. The morning cloak, the viceroy, the red spotted purple, and the tiger swallowtail. In addition to that, when flowers, our bees, both our native bees and our honeybees love this tree. Uh, so it's really valuable to wildlife. And a quirky thing about the tree, the bark of the willow, black willow, contains a chemical called salicin, which can be made into salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is the active ingredient in aspirin. So this tree, the tree bark and stems were used as a headache remedy by uh, Native Americans and by our, Europe, our early settlers before we had Walgreens, CVSs, and Kroger's. The next tree is one of my favorites, the common persimmon. Uh, well, in the woods, it grows tall and upright. Its leaves are not that distinctive. They're, um, they're, uh, they're uh, alternately placed on the, uh, on the stem, simple leaves uh, with a smooth margin on them. Uh, they're very pale underneath, shiny on top, uh, very oval shaped. Uh, the bark of a common persimmon, uh, also known as the American persimmon, though is very distinctive. The, the tree grows very tall in the woods as it works its way uh, into, uh, let me go ahead and let Carolyn drink into our session, uh, into, the, uh, in, into the sun. And it has this blocky bark on it, uh, which uh, resembles alligator bark. That's the term we like to use as a descriptive to it, this very distinctive bla uh, black uh, alligator bark uh, on it. It has a high canopy, fairly narrow canopy too, so it's a pretty distinctively um, shaped tree. The tree is dioecious, so you have male trees and you have female trees. And the highlight of the persimmon is what the female tree produces, which is its fruit. It's tasty. If you've never had a ripe persimmon, uh, you've missed out. They're very sweet. There's a lot of seeds in them, but you can use, you can eat them off. You can, don't, you can eat them, a mature persimmon. You can make uh, jellies and jams out of them. They're great with baking and cooking. Um, it is a favorite of wildlife. I will warn you, make sure you eat a ripe persimmon. Uh, you, you know a persimmon is ripe if it's on the ground, if it's dropped, or if when you touch it off the limb, it just falls off in your hand. If you have to tug at all, even if it's orange and looks ripe, you probably don't want to bite into it. If you do bite into an unripe persimmon, it'll be the last time you'll do that. It will, it's like having a spoonful of alum in your mouth. Your tongue gets weird, it's bitter, it, 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 you can't talk for a few minutes and you won't do it again. But once they, they do mature quickly, uh, and when they do, they're very sweet. The fruit is high in vitamin C and coyotes love them. We know it as coyote candy. So easy to tell coyotes scat in the fall because it'll always be full of persimmon seeds. But it's not just coyotes, possums, raccoons, skunks, deer, and birds, they all feed on the fruit. Uh, the uh, tree is also the larval host for the luna, luna moth and the, the flowers do attract honeybees. Uh, next tree is another pioneer species tree, which is the Eastern Cottonwood. The tree is dioecious, so you do have boy trees and girl trees. 
uh, it will be one of the first trees to show up uh, um, on new ground. Uh, because of that, it does have an aggressive root system. So this is another tree you don't want to be planting anywhere near, have located near your house or your, your, your sewer lines and things of that nature. Uh, the tree can grow very tall, up to 100 feet tall. Um, very distinctive tree, makes beautiful sound in the woods. The leaves are a deltoid shape, very large with a long, flat petiole. That leaf stem on it is very long and flat. Um, and because of that, uh, with the tall trees, even a slight breeze makes them rustle and rustle in the wind, even with a very slight breeze, and it sounds like running water. It sounds like a babbling brook. So aesthetically, this is a wonderful tree to have uh, in the woods. It just makes a great sound. The females are prolific seed producers. Uh, millions of seeds come off of the mature trees uh, within a given season. They are wind-borne seeds on those light little fluffy um, you know, pieces like that. And Black willow does it the same way too, by the way. Um, the uh, birds eat the seeds and the cottonwood um, the, is the larval host for the morning cloak, the viceroy, this purple, and the tiger swallowtail butterflies also. So that is your eastern cottonwood. Now, this is a tree with a personality, makes it one of my favorites. The honey locust. Pretty easy to tell the honey locust. The leaves are compound, sometimes double compound with these small little lancelet leaves. You can have as many as 30 of these little leaflets uh, on, on the leaf. Um, it is dioecious uh, and it does have these seed pods on the females, which are long, can be about 12 inches to 14 inches long. And um, within, that, uh, within that seed pod is a very sweet pulp that we'll talk about in just a minute. The trunk is pretty distinctive of the honey locust. It's black and smooth with the exception, little platy with mature trees, but with the exception of these huge thorns, which are made out of wood, very sharp. They will go through your shoe. They will go through a tire. So they're very hard and sharp. And honey locusts will make thorns on thorns. I've seen thorn limbs on honey locusts three to four feet long. Uh, it's pretty crazy, um, pretty crazy tree. Uh, and uh, very distinctive, distinctive in its look. Uh, the uh, pulp within the, uh, within the um, seed pods is eaten by deer, birds, and small mammals. It's very sweet. And Native Americans use it to make flour and other, and teas and things of that nature. So if you, have, if you ever see a honey locust with mature sweet, uh, seed pod, break it open, smell it, taste it. It's very sweet, it's good, it's human edible. The seeds are not human edible, however. Seeds are eaten by birds, but don't eat seeds. They will make you sick. The uh, tree is a larval is the larval host for the silver spotted skipper, the bicolored honey locust moth, the bisected honey locust moth, and the flowers are popular with honeybees and they're also popular with uh, honey producers. They feel like bees that feed off of honey locusts actually create a uh, superior honey. So that's the honey locust. Next up is our state tree of Texas is the pecan. A uh, tree which grows in bottomlands. You find them along river uh, floodplains and creek floodplains mainly. Uh, the leaves are alternately placed and compound. Uh, you can have oh, up to about 10 to 12 leaves on it. Uh, you'll always have a terminal leaf on a uh, leaf left on the uh, on the leaf. And notice how they, uh, the pecan leaves leaflets tend to sway back towards the base. That's called being falcate when they kind of like curl like a banana. That's one way you can tell a pecan. They have gray shaggy bark. These guys can get huge, 120 feet tall, five to six you know, foot wide trunk. They can live a long time, 300 years or so. Uh, there's a lot of cultivars out there. These were cultivated by Native Americans. Uh, they have been for thousands of years. The United States produces about 90% of the pecans in the world. And Texas is the second um, largest pecan producer behind Georgia within the country. A, um, a large pecan can produce as many as uh, 150 pounds, 70 to 150 pounds of pecans in a given season. Uh, so that's our state tree, the pecan. That nut is rich in protein, very popular with wildlife. And the tree is the uh, larval host for the gray hair streak butterfly. Next up is the red mulberry, which doesn't get real tall, up to about 50 feet. Sometimes it reaches the canopy. The leaves are large. Uh, and alternately placed on the stem. The tree is dioecious most of the time. Sometimes it's, it will have both genders on the same tree. This tree has a little bit of a hard time making up its mind. Uh, its leaves will be large. They're fairly rough to the touch. Um, they will sometimes have lobes, sometimes not. Uh, generally, you'll find them without lobes, like the one in the picture, or with one lobe, like the one in the picture, which looks like a mitten, or maybe another lobe on the opposite side where you would have three lobes. 
If you want to be sure you have a mulberry, take a leaf off, squeeze the leaf stem on your finger, and if you get a little bit of white sap, latexy looking sap coming out the end, you know you've got a red mul you've got a mulberry tree. And if the leaf is rough, you have a red mulberry tree. This tree uh, produces uh, flowers early in the spring and produces this great blackberry looking fruit, uh, which is tasty, very tasty, and very high in vitamins that wildlife loves. They don't stay in the tree real long because the birds and the squirrels will be after them really quickly. As I mentioned, it's high in vitamins uh, and all sorts of minerals. In addition to that wonderful, valuable fruit is the larval host or the morning cloak butterfly. This is a very common tree in North Texas, the sugar hackberry. Ah, I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. Uh, the leaves on it are alternately placed and lanceolate. They kind of look like elms a little bit. They can be toothed, but the venation is different where you have three primary veins come off of that leaf stem. Uh, the trunks of sugar hackberries are pretty distinctive. They've got all those little corky warts all over them to varying degrees. Some trees will have just a few, other trees will be loaded down. Uh, the value to this tree is its fruit, um, which is human, human edible. There's not hardly anything to it because it's mainly seed, but you can eat them, they are sweet. Very valuable to wildlife because they persist through the winter time. They, they fruit in the fall, they persist through the winter. So once again, this is another tree that provides a, a very valuable food source for our mammals and our birds during, during the winter months when there's not as much available. Uh, as I mentioned, the leaves and twigs are browsed by deer, the berries are eaten by birds and small mammals. And this tree is the larval host for the hackberry emperor, pretty little, pretty little butterfly. Okay, another Jeopardy question for you. Tree biology. Now, the vascular tissue that flows food produced by the leaves, by photosynthesis from roots to stems. So what tissue flows the wood down those sugars and the food for tree down. All right, y'all got this one. Very good. It's the answer is, well, if I can get the word, the answer is phloem. That's the tissue that pulls the sugars that the leaves are making through photosynthesis and pulls it down into the tree and feeds the tree. So you've got things going in both directions within a tree. Tree uh, biology is much more complex than most people give it, give it credit for. Let's keep going. I have just a handful of small understory trees uh, that I'll, I'll cover quickly. This is one of my favorites though. This is the Hercules Club. Uh, it has alternately placed co um, uh, compound leaves uh, and has their fine. I'm glad you like to listen to it. Oh, sorry, it's hard, it's hard at me. It's about Let our host turn off the audio. Thank you. Um, so they'll have seven to nine leaves with a terminal leaf, very finely toothed leaflets. Uh, the bark is, I mean, yeah, the, the trunk is really um, easy to identify. It'll be smooth, but it'll have these shark's teeth-like extrusions that you'll see on it. Uh, when these originally came out, they would have had thorns at the ends of them, but they fall off pretty quickly and kind of leave these molar looking like um, extrusions on them. The other thing with the leaf too, this isn't always, but if you see this, you know you've got a Hercules club. Look at the base of a couple of leaflets and you will see these little spines. Here I have a blow up of it that may be growing at a 45 degree angle. If you see that, you have a Hercules club. Um, if you don't see it, it doesn't mean you don't have a Hercules club, but that's a, a true identifier. But why do I love this tree? Because if you chew on a couple of the leaves or a stem, it will create a numbing sensation in your mouth. It will numb your mouth. Another name for this tree, a nickname for this tree is toothache tree uh, because it was used by Native Americans and early settlers uh, pre-Walgreens days uh, uh, as a toothache remedy. And it, it, it does work. It will numb your mouth, not like Novocaine, but it does definitely create a numbing sensation for about 10 minutes or so. So try that once we uh, once these guys start to put the juices flowing again this spring. Check that out. Uh, the deer forage on the leaves, birds and mammals will eat the fruit and the seeds. And this is the larval host, a key larval host for the giant swallowtail butterfly. Um, I don't think it's the only host, but it is a key host for the giant swallowtail. Uh, it is the nectar source for butterflies and bees. Mexican plum is next, and these are about to flower. And that's why I included this one in, because you're going to see these as like 
in the woods where everything is brown, but you're gonna see these big white clouds on a tree and it's probably a Mexican plum tree. Before they leave, they will put out these beautiful white flowers, which makes it an important nectar source for early arising pollinators that, are, that, uh, that come out early in the season. The leaves are simple and alternate, and they have a tendency, they're oval and they're, they're toothed, and they have a tendency to fold down on themselves. This tree tends to look like it's always wanting to be watered, but that's just the tendency of the tree. Uh, it, they just tend to fold down that nature. The, uh, the uh, trunk is platy uh, with uh, these uh, plates that will be peeling off horizontally on each end, left and right. That's a pretty typical uh, Mexican plum trunk there. They do put out these plums. They're okay, they're human edible. You can bake with them. You gotta put a lot of sugar in them, but you can't bake with them, but wildlife usually gets them pretty darn fast. Uh, but that's the Mexican plum. They, they, uh, they're very hardy. They'll grow in upland areas along with lower areas, and they tend to be a bit of a solitary tree. Uh, as I mentioned, the fruit's prized by wildlife. It is the larval host for the tiger swallowtail and the cecropia moth, and it is the nectar source for butterflies and bees. Uh, especially early in the season uh, when there's not a lot of choices. Uh, this is a possum holly, uh, one of the two hollies that grow in the area. And this is a deciduous holly, which is very unique for this tree. It does drop its leaves. And you may notice this tree now, you see, if you see a small tree, 10 to 15 feet that has red berries all over it, no leaves, but just full of red berries, you're probably looking at a possum holly. It has a very smooth bark, uh, you'll find these in your, your wetter areas. It's a popular landscape tree. Uh, it has another, there's another species called Yopon holly, which doesn't quite have its native range here, but I do find them in the woods on occasion. It is a heavily landscaped tree and they will grow in the area, but generally their range is to the south and east of here. But the possum haw uh, is the one that will lose its leaves. Uh, the deer browse on its young twigs. The fruit attracts small mammals and birds. And it's a favorite food source for possums, and that's where it got its name, is possum holly. It is also known as a deciduous holly. Okay, this is our last tree, uh, I believe. This is the rough leaf dogwood. It's small, gets up 12 to 15 feet uh, tall, has uh, oppositely placed simple leaves. They're oval in shape. The veins will curve towards the margin or run parallel to the margin before they actually get to the edge. They flower in the spring with these beautiful bouquets of four petal flowers that will fertilize into these beautiful off-white berries. And man, migratory birds love this, this, this plant. It's really more of a bush than a tree and they'll grow along edges and thickets and you'll, it'll be a bird party in the fall when they, when they do bury out. Um, as I mentioned, leaves and twigs are eaten by the deer, nectar source for the bees, butterflies, and other insects. And there's at least 40 species of birds and, and wildlife that do feed off the berries of the rough leaf dogwood. And it got its name from its, the, the feel of the leaf. It is a rough leaf, so it's rough to the touch. One last question. Category tree biology, the growth layer of the tree that creates the new xylem and phloem cells during the growing season. So we've talked about xylem and phloem cells. Now, what layer is in this tree that is actually creating those cells as the tree grows. Dana, you got, okay, you guys are getting it. It's the vascular cambia. Think of it like a tube that's running just inside the bark layer of the tree. Uh, and on the inside of that tube, the cambium, uh, the vascular cambium is growing xylem cells. And that is where things will, you know, flow up from the ground and also that creates the wood. Xylem is, um, wood is made from xylem cells. Then you have on the outside of this tube, the phloem cells being created and they will be pushing down the sugars from the, from the, or pulling down the sugars from the leaves and those create the cork cells or bark of a tree. Also, that's where that comes from. Xylem is wood, phloem turns into, turns into, your, uh, turns into your bark. And with that, I will unshare and I will be glad to answer any questions that y'all have for me. Hope y'all enjoy the talk. Thank you, Vic. Um, I see that we had a question from Grace a little earlier uh, when you were talking about pecan trees. Is it okay to have a pecan tree about five feet from my house? Well, you know, they'll get 120 feet tall by about, you know, 60 to 80 feet wide and they'll start dropping pecans all over your roof. 
I actually have a pecan in my yard, which is probably too close too. Um, but it may be a while before they get that big. I probably wouldn't have it that close. Give pecans a lot of room just because they're so large and because of the nature of the fruit, unless you want to get woke up in the middle of the night with, you know, the pitter pack of pecans on your roof. See, so Jolene is asking about the Yopon Holly. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you bring that up in the presentation when you were talking about the possum haw? Right. Was somebody just asking about the Yopon? Yes. Yeah, it is. It, it's native range. It's natural range is a little south and east of us. But, you know, in the southern part of the Metroplex, it's, it may be more common. I, you know, run the woods in, in Collin County, Hunt County, Denton County, kind of the northern side. Every now and then I do see it, but not near as common as the possum haw. Uh, and we're a little, we're a little north of its, its natural range, but the Yopon holly is a great tree, very valuable in our woodlands. And you can make tea from the leaves, I understand, and it makes a fine tea. And it's evergreen, unlike the possum haw. What else you got? All right, we've got another question. Where does carbon in the trees come from? The ground it grows in or the CO2 from the atmosphere? It's coming from the atmosphere. Uh, you're, you're touching on a major, major benefit of trees is that they, as part of the photosynthetic process of a tree, uh, trees do the exact opposite of what we do. They take in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. Uh, they will they will take in an acre of trees will take in uh, about six tons of carbon in, in a given year. They're major carbon absorbers, and that's important in in our in terms of climate change and global warming. So they, it ends up being locked inside the tree. Now, if the tree burns, it unlocks the carbon and it gets re-released in the atmosphere. So it's not a permanent lock unless it just finally ends up underground and gets locked in like peat bogs and things of that nature. But uh, the trees are really important. That's why there's so many big tree planting campaigns for several reasons. But one of them is the, uh, the carbon absorption nature of our trees that they're so efficient at doing, at doing that. So that's where it comes from. It's pulling it out of our atmosphere. We have a question from Becky, Broughleaf Dogwood. Where does it grow best and any transplanting advice? Uh, it's an edge tree, it likes sun. So you'll, you'll generally find it along edges of woodlands um, because it is a sun lover. Sometimes I'll find it in the interior, but it's, it's definitely happiest along edges. Um, it can naturally grow in, like I said, in the thickets, you know, 30, 40 feet, 50, sometimes 50 yards long. Um, so expect it to grow more like a bush than a tree. It's multi-trunk, not real big, 12, 15 feet tall usually. Um, uh, and, and, but if you have an edge area, it makes a great edge. And a tree that I didn't mention due to time constraints is sumac. Uh, we have a couple of sumacs that grow in the area, smooth sumac and uh, shining sumac. And they're wonderful edge, small edge trees also. And both, they're also very valuable to wildlife. I just didn't have enough room in this presentation to cover it. Uh, but they're both great. Um, they grow and they grow easy. They grow in the area. They don't have to overlap them at all once you get them established. Any other questions? I have a question. And um, my question is, when I see the coyote scat and it has the persimmon seeds in it, in my mind, I'm thinking uh, that's been scarified and I don't have to do the work. So if I gathered those persimmon seeds, would they be more likely to grow into a persimmon tree as opposed to putting them directly into the ground? Yes, um, probably. Yes, that's, you know, that's, um, that's one way that, that uh, trees, uh, through the wisdom of nature, uh, help trees uh, propagate is they um, have great fruit that they advertise to our wildlife. Please eat it and then poop it. <laughs> and that helps scarify and prepare the seed uh, for uh, um, for you know, for growing, uh, it's, uh, the seed is just a baby plant, uh, and so if it's scarified, it's going to have its ability to pop out and actually grow and grow into a plant. And that's why most fruits, that's why, that's why fruits are a natural laxative. It's very intentional. It wants those animals to eat those seeds, and then it's going to make sure it comes out the other end. 
<laughs> it falls on the ground somewhere. So uh, yes, that does scarify the seeds and it, it would help them be more viable. Okay, what about fig trees? Uh, are fig trees a native tree? No, they're not. That's a Mediterranean tree. Um, I have a fig tree on my property. Um, I would recommend if you want to plant a fig tree um, uh, that you, uh, there's a, a fig tree called the uh, Celeste fig or sugar fig. It's the most cold resistant. Now I will, uh, mine was 10 years old uh, and it never got knocked back by winters until last February. Snowmageddon, the, the week of zero degree temperatures, that's the first time it got knocked back where I had to take her to the ground. It didn't kill it, it's coming back, but that tree is the most cold resistant. Another great fig is black turkey fig, but it will tend to, the, the canopy will tend to die off in our winters, especially if we have any teens at all. And you'll be starting over again year after year, you know, with the tree, so. I do see one question that I answer, I can answer about, can we get a copy of the presentation or transcript? Uh, the recording will be available uh, for this on the YouTube playlist for this series. And I'm going to post in the chat the website for uh, the pond, our uh, podcast on Natural Dallas, which has links to our podcast recordings, as well as the Master Naturalist series recordings. So you can get, uh, we'll have that posted uh, sometime in the next few days. So you'll be able to get back to this. And Greg, I'll be happy to uh, send you a PDF copy of the, uh, um, of the slides if you want uh, and for, for distribution or if anybody wants to email me, uh, my email address is travisfam2, the number two, T-R-A-V-I-S-F-A-M, number two, at yahoo.com. You can use that email and I'll, I'll make a PDF of the slides and send them. I'm, I'm happy to share. Great, thank you. And I'd be happy to get that out. Okay, great. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Do we have black locust in our area? Black locust, you know, th there's been a couple of times I thought I was staring at a black locust uh, on the eastern side of the Metroplex. It tends to grow to the east of us, uh, but I may have been looking at a honey locust. It just didn't have any thorns on it. Sometimes that will happen. Generally, there are different kinds of trees. Generally, they're to the east of our area, though. Uh, they, they don't, I would say no. I, you know, they might be on rare occasion, but the, they range to the east of here. And somebody was asking for my email. So what I'll do real quick is I'm gonna reshare this last slide so you can pick up, pick up the email address right there. Yeah, we're getting a lot of positive feedback that um, I'm sure uh, everybody has seen in the, the chat uh, about uh, praising your presentation, and it, it has just been excellent. Uh, I see some new questions are still coming in. We're going to uh, try to wrap these up, but we we'll may be able to do just a couple, couple more. Uh, uh, we had a comment from Susan about uh, whether sumac is too aggressive in urban landscapes. Well, it, it will grow, sumac will grow in, in thickets along edges. Um, so, uh, so it depends on where you put it uh, and how, you know, what, how much property you have, your type of landscaping. When it's in thickets along edges, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, now sumac is dioecious. So also depending upon what you want to do, if you want a lot, if you want the fruit, you know, make sure you get a female, um, you know, and, and the best flowers and the, and the fruit that there would be obviously the females. But if you've got a ways, you know, and you've got property, you want to have, you have a nice edge effect. Sumac's great, and it's so valuable to wildlife. And it's beautiful in the fall. It turns bright red. Uh, gorgeous plant. Gorgeous plant. Tree. Small tree. Anything else? We have a comment from Becky that she's grown persimmons. Um, American by throwing scat in wild riparian area. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the, they're really easy to collect with the scat uh, in the fall. It's so easy. <laughs> the, I have a Texas persimmon planted. Uh, will that cross pollinate with a common persimmon? Do you know? And the Texas persimmon doesn't range here naturally. They'll grow here, uh, but they, they don't range here naturally. Um, so you won't, seeds won't. I never see a Texas persimmon in the woods. The seeds don't germinate. Generally, range is, range is, de, is, is determined by a, a seed's ability to germinate. Uh, you know, like, um, so the tree will grow here if you have a tree to plant, but this, if it puts out seeds, they just don't. 
it's just not the right conditions, temperature, water, whatever it may be. Um, but the Texas persimmon has great, those, those dark blue black fruits, which are, are great to eat. Uh, they're more of a bushier tree plant uh, versus the very long um, American persimmons. But they don't cross pollinate, no. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Becky's asking another follow-up question on the Texas persimmon, what the range is? Well, it's, I know they're in the hill country. Um, they, they start to the south of here and they roll through the southern middle part of the state. I can't remember, I'm not, I don't have a good visual map of exactly what it, what it, what it looks like, but I, I know they're south of here. I know they're all over the hill country. You know, that area, the escarpment uh, eco-region for sure. Thanks once again, Rick. Uh, sure. I see it's uh, about six minutes afternoon. So thanks for hanging around and answering questions. I, I hope uh, we may have missed a couple, but uh, again, I would invite you to go back, uh, anybody and, and watch the recording if you miss any information. Uh, and I want to thank everybody that attended and we hope to see you at our next Master Naturalist present talk in March. And uh, the, the plan is to have our presenter zooming from the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center. So that should, that should be good. So cool. thank everybody. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun, enjoyed it.